but I, I'm going to talk to you about clinical approaches to detoxification in pediatric disorders. Uh, and this is because, in essence, for the last decade, a little more than a decade, I've really focused on that area. I have over, way over 2,000 kids uh, in my practice with autism spectrum disorders and the other four A's, uh, asthma, allergies, and ADHD, as well as autism spectrum. So I'm going to share with you some of the, um, you know, kind of the pearls and some of the approaches. And, it, you know, it's not, there's very much similarities. Um, I only have an hour. I usually like to speak a lot longer. So we'll probably have some of the things we'll have to deal with in the question and answer period because, uh, uh, because of length of time. All right. So it's essence, this is a, this is a slide. Actually, some of the, a few of these slides are actually borrowed from Dr. Quigg uh, uh, with his permission and with his gracious courtesy. And... Uh, and this is one of them because it just so nicely uh, uh, depicts the environmental toxicity. Now, I know you've heard this before. It's a little bit hard for me over here because of the angles, so I'll do my best to, to point. But, you know, in essence, we're living in a chemical soup, and our children are growing up in a chemical soup. And these toxicants are coming of all different types and coming from all over. And you see here uh, smokestacks, and you see amalgam fillings you've heard about from Boyd. You see an occupational with soldering. You see paint, which no longer has lead, but can have mercury and sometimes even uh, uh, can have manganese and sometimes even mercury as an anti-mold. Um, you obviously see smoke, exhaust smoke. Um, you see uh, big fish, you know, tuna, swordfish, unfortunately sea bass, unfortunately the delectable, delicious fish that I used to love so much, a nice sushi gray tuna, but unfortunately they're too high in uh, methylmercury. Uh, cigarette smoke, of course, and lastly, some iatrogenic causes of things that we uh, inject, um, and we and we obviously want to keep out things like thimerosal and other aluminum and formaldehyde and other kinds of uh, chemicals and toxicants. So I'm going to just give you when I talk about detoxification, I think I just want to give you a bit of a, uh, a sense of the toxicity for the kids. It's very important in some of the studies showing the toxicity, and then we'll spend the second half on the treatment because it's really important for you to see it, and. This is just essentially showing you the huge exponential increase over the last 50 years, essentially since the 40s, since the mid-40s uh, after World War II, huge exponential increase in uh, the production of uh, chemicals. US, a, uh, US EPA estimates that approximately 87,000 chemicals in use today. And that's not a hard and fast figure. I've seen 85,000, I've seen 100,000. So it's somewhere in that range, but it's huge. The uh, plastic industry in this country growing at the rate of 6 to 12 percent per year since the mid-1940s, and in other countries, developing countries, expanding at the rate of like around 40 percent per year. So th this is a huge, huge problem. And this is just it in graphic form. You see this exponential rise uh, in chemical production, especially uh, after World War II from the 40s and, and up. And around two to 3,000 new chemicals introduced each year. And the problem is, Many of the chemicals that are out there have not been studied. And if they have been studied, <clears throat> they've been studied in single uh, toxin uh, adverse outcomes. So the threshold for toxicity is based on that single toxin. And the reality is common sense. This doesn't take rocket science. How many of us and how many of our children are exposed to single toxicants? Rarely. It's really we are exposed to multiple toxicants and this whole concept that was mentioned about synergistic toxicity is very important. And so that the testing now is having to be refined to reflect this. The old testing of single toxic and single threshold just does not make it for what's happening out there. Sources of toxins are everywhere, in the air, in the water, in the food. And these are some of those environmental toxins that are known to cause damage to children's developing brains and nervous systems, which, as you heard before, are exquisitely sensitive, and I'll show you a slide uh, of exactly why. The heavy metals like lead, mercury, cadmium, and arsenic, and the multiple types of chemicals, the PCBs, the chlorinated dibenzofurans, the organophosphate pesticides, and the one that is really problematic is the brominated flame retardants, because you know that's the old, and I like, like to say this uh, when I lecture, that that is like the conundrum of technology and the advances. You don't want your child burning up in fire at night when they're sleeping. So in essence, there's reason to want to put them in bed clothes and um, you know, mattress covers and uh, blankets that are, have flame retardants. The problem is they're sleeping 8, 10, 11, 12 hours a night exposed to these chemicals. And that is really a problem. 
And this is, this is why it's so relevant for children. This is a slide talking about the vulnerability of children to pollution. And children are much more vulnerable. Why? Because they have more rapid, uh, rapidly developing systems as well as incomplete defense systems. Think about the exposure. Boyd told you about the uh, thimerosal and the hepatitis B at birth being a appropriate for a 275 pound person. And this is a what, an eight or 10 pound infant, right? So pound for pound, the exposures are much greater. The fetus essentially has no blood-brain barrier. The neonate has a very, very immature and porous blood-brain barrier. So all of those chemicals and toxins have much greater access to the brain and the CNS. Children have lower levels of, of chemical binding proteins that would actually kind of make them less toxic and so that allows more of it to be in the free toxic forms and more of it to reach the target organs. Uh, the rapid development, of course, makes, it more, uh, makes them more prone to problems and more, and more vulnerable to the chemical exposures. You heard about the biliary system being undeveloped. What color is a neonate, usually? What, what, yellow, why? Hyperbilirubinemia, neonatal hyperbilirubinemia, uh, neonatal jaundice is very, very common. We say it's physiologic. Why is that? Because their biliary system is not developed. And so if the biliary system is not developed, it is crazy to inject them with a toxicant that needs to be eliminated through the biliary system, i.e. thimerosal. So giving hepatitis B vaccination at birth, except in a hepatitis B positive mother, makes no sense to me at all, none at all. And the lastly, the longer future lifespan of a child makes them more prone to, to uh, abnormal effects over the course of their lifetime. You give toxicants to an 85-year-old, it takes 20, 30 years to manifest, they're probably going to be gone, right? Maybe not with your anti-aging measures, but, you know, for the most part, right? A child has the, the whole length of their life to manifest these toxicity. And let me just go through some, a, a couple of quick studies just to show you the evidence for this. I mean, I, I don't think I'm going to have to convince you that much, so I'm going I'm to run through them pretty quickly. These are just uh, a study showing that hydroxy, these are metabolites of PCBs, hydroxy PCBs and other environmental chemicals may disrupt normal neuronal development and cause some developmental brain disorders such as learning disabilities, ADHD, and autism. You see a lot of tie-in between ADHD and autism and, that, autism, and that's why I actually linked them together in the book on the four A's. This is bisphenol A. Everybody's probably heard about BPA, a major plasticizer, right, in, 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 in plastics. This is its immune effects. In essence, prenatally, i.e. in utero and even and in adulthood, promoting Th2 skewing. And what, what we're seeing with all this epidemic increase in allergies and asthma is a skewing of the immune system to Th2. And I, have, I would love to be able to tell you, I don't have the time, but it's very interesting lectures about immunotoxicity and where it's coming from. Um, and that's for another time, unfortunately. But what, one of the ways that this is mediated is by a reduction of T reg cells, regulatory T cells. They are a very, very com key player in the immune system to regulate the Th1, Th2 balance. And because they're impairing T reg function, you're getting this Th2 skewing, which is going to promote um, asthma, allergies, and, and, and even contributes to certain subsets of autism and ADHD. All right. And this is just. Uh, showing something we call epigenetic effects, all right, where exposing mice in, uh, in utero, the, the fetus, the, the, the normal mouse is supposed to be this spelt brown-haired mouse, but in utero exposure to bisphenol A causes them to become these obese, blonde-haired mice. And what it is happening is the BPA is actually affecting the genes. It's called an epigenetic. So, you know, the old thing of that you are just the genes from your mother and father. We know that's not true. And the whole, the, the whole, there's a whole field now of epigenetics, which is so crucial because if a chemical or a, a toxin affects your gene, not only does it affect this mouse, but it's vertically transmitted to its offspring. So you can actually affect not only gene expression in the subject, but in the offspring. And that is very scary. 